Hi, everyone. This is Ashanti Carter, and I'm filling in for Dr. Gigi, and I want to welcome you to our, our very important conversation, Innocence Loss. And this is a conversation about how to increase awareness about sexual assault. So boy, oh boy, do we have some great panelists for you. We have Indira Hannard and Ms. Tamara Washington of GW. So as you know, there was some important information um, that was shared today, and that was with the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial. So I would like to open this up. It's a safe space for us. And I would like to open it to, with Tamara and Dara. Do you have any words or comments that you wanna share with us? Ooh. And Dara, as you see me like breathing out, exhaling, um, exhaling. Um, I mean, I think it's important that one, um, as a community of color, like it's okay for us to celebrate this moment, right? Like we deserve this moment. Um, however, I, I think that we all kind of sat on the edge of our seats a few minutes ago for the last hour, probably for decades waiting for quote unquote justice like this or a verdict like this, um, hoping for something that should be the norm, right? Like, and so, I'll say that though I am relieved to see the verdict and the way that it landed, um, it's only but one minuscule step to what our nation and nations need to do and need to be doing to protect black and brown folks. Um, and so I think that's where I'll stop. And then Dara, I'll, I'll pass the mic on to you to, to say any kind of comments you have. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Tamara, and it's so great to be with you and be with the Rodham Institute and all of you out there. I think first what I just want to say is let's just take a breath, right? Let's just take a breath. Um, I know for me, uh, my heart has been beating fast all day, right? And even leading up to this moment. And so my message to folks is it's okay to feel however you are feeling in this moment. What we also know to be true is that justice is a continuum, right? And justice looks different for everyone. And what we have to continue to remember and uphold is that someone lost a son, someone lost a brother, a boyfriend, um, a father, right? A human being, right? Um, and so for me, I'm continuing to hold the Floyd, the Floyd family and everyone that he touched um, high um, and sending prayers. What we also must remember is that all forms of oppression are connected, right? And that we can't talk about state sanctioned violence without talking about sexual violence and racial justice and reproductive justice and LGBTQI and all of those forms of isms. So yes, we can take a breath for a moment. Um, we saw accountability today, right? Um, but the work continues. And so I you know, encourage folks to protect their heart uh, today and in the days and in the weeks coming, protect their peace, um, whatever uh, that looks like for folks. And, you know, I'm sending so much love and light to those who are holding space, healing spaces um, for clients and those who understand what does it mean to experience compounded trauma, as well as to witness and experience Black pain on a, go on a global scale, right? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. And I echo what you said. So I wanna jump into the conversation and I do apologize for not introducing you, but you know what? You can actually introduce yourself better than I can. So Indira, I wanna start with you. Can you just tell the audience about yourself and tell us about the work that you do. Sure, thank you so much. My name is Indira Hennard and I'm the executive director of the DC Rape Crisis Center, which is the oldest rape crisis center in the country and the only one in Washington, DC. We are in our 49th year, which is really exciting as we're walking into 50 
uh, next year. I have been doing gender-based violence work for almost 20 years. Um, and what we know to be true at the DC Rape Crisis Center is what I just said. All forms of oppression are connected. Um, we serve survivors of sexual violence at the intersection. Um, we offer individual and group counseling to survivors of sexual violence as well as secondary survivors. We have our 24 seven hotline. We do training and technical assistance, community engagement and prevention work, um, as well as advocacy work. Um, what I will say is that um, this is a watershed moment for sexual violence. We are operating in unprecedented times. Um, and the work of the DC Rape Crisis Center, we have been on the ground and in the trenches. Um, we have been able to pivot quickly um, in the midst of what I call the COVID trauma, the racial trauma, as well as the political trauma. Um, and what I will say is that um, we cannot forget the ways in which uh, BIPOC survivors of sexual violence are being impacted by the various um, traumas that are happening um, in our world simultaneously. Um, and I think what we are seeing right now as we're witnessing um, the George Floyd verdict and all of the emotions that are pouring out on social media and in the streets is that this is also impacting survivors. Um, so we have our counselors on standby. Uh, we have our advocates on, on standby, uh, serving survivors who are being who excuse me who are being impacted by this intersection. Wow, your work is just amazing, Indira. Amazing. So, Tamara, I'm going to pass it to you. Sure. Thank you. Um, and I always want to honor folks who came before me. So yes, I want to just give you your applause, Indira, um, for all the work and ways that you have led the work in DC for folks like me to come on along. Um, but hello, everyone. My name is Tamara, Tamara like camera, all A's, Washington. Um, and I serve as the Assistant Director for the Office of Advocacy and Support at George Washington University. Um, and so I have been in the field of survivor advocacy interpersonal work for about six years. Um, so less than half of the time uh, of my counterpart. And I'm super excited to learn more about and learn from Andira today, as well as Ashanti and everyone else on the call. Um, and so the, the mission of my office is that we really provide um, support and empowerment to anybody who experiences any form of harm um, so connected to what Indira just spoke about, we recognize that um, all forms of oppression and systems of oppression are interconnected. Um, and so in order for us to actually assist and support someone who experiences sexual assault, we also have to think about that intersection with their race and their ability and all these other things. And so we help anyone who experiences any form of harm, um, which is different and new, um, different and unique in the district as we think about higher education. Usually you'll see at different institutions, um, advocacy offices like mine who support folks who only experience sexual assault or interpersonal violence, right? We, were, we are intentional about any form of harm to include all of, uh, you know, all of the different forms, right? And so um, one, we do that by providing advocacy work, um, confidential advocacy work. So we are confidential on our campus, which is great. And we'll talk more about how that kind of um, is impactful for folks who use our resources as we go on to the conversation. Um, and we also do that through prevention work. So we are the go-to primary office on campus who are um, kind of doing this education on campus around consent, healthy relationships, um, bystander intervention. But when I say bystander intervention, I don't just mean like, oh, you see something, you say something, but like really looking at the environment and the contacts and folks who are taking up those spaces and what that means. So as a black and brown, person, bystander intervention may not be just me calling somebody out, right? Like, or calling the police or whatever that is. And so we really take into consideration what those identities are. Um, and so what else we do on campus is we really emphasize healing um, and healing uh, by the words of, of students and survivors. So not determined by a system, not determined by our Title IX office, not determined by any other office, but the person that we see in front of us. Um, and so that's important to emphasize here that we are super um, committed to, to, to thinking outside of the box, right, of what does healing look like? 
um, and maybe it's not reporting mechanisms. So I'll talk more about that as we go on. But that's me. Um, and I'm super excited to continue this conversation. Thank you so much. And Tamara was also very modest. She is a doctoral student at the at GW's um, School of Education, so and human development. So um, let's let's get into the conversation. Oh, one more thing. For those of you in Facebook land and on the call, please, please, please ask our panelists questions. Use the QA box. If you're on Facebook, use the comment box. And so we'll get to as many questions as possible because this isn't just a monologue, you guys, we want you to participate as well. So how has COVID-19 impacted your work at your organization? I'll start with you, Indira. Yeah, wow. I feel like uh, that's such a big question because it's impacted us in just monumental ways. As I mentioned, the DC Rape Crisis Center, we were able to pivot really quickly um, and shift all of our services to a telehealth platform. We have an amazing clinical team who have just uh, been working nonstop to make sure that services were not interrupted. Um, what I will say is that all of our services now are on a telehealth platform. What we had to do as a result of COVID is all of our therapists got licensed in all three jurisdictions of DC, Maryland, and Virginia so that there would not be a jurisdictional ethical issue with seeing clients who don't live in um, DC. We have expanded our services seven days a week. Our crisis sessions have increased by over 80%, as you can imagine, as a result of, again, not just the COVID trauma, but the racial trauma and the political trauma. I think, you know, what folks didn't realize during the COVID pandemic is this is something that no one was prepared for, particularly nonprofits. And so while folks were shifting their services to a telehealth platform, not only did we have to have to do that, but we had to check in with clients to make sure that they have the necessary tools in order to engage in services on a telehealth platform. So as I like to tell folks, Wi-Fi is a privilege, right? Everybody doesn't have Wi-Fi. When you are worried about pocketbook issues, trying to put food on the table, trying to pay rent, Wi-Fi is an issue. And so we had to check in with our clients to make sure that they not only had access to Wi-Fi and also making sure they have electricity, right? And if they did not have a laptop or some type of technology device, we provided that for them, right? So again, looking at sexual violence from the intersections, what we know to be true is that sexual violence is not a single issue because we don't live single issue lives. And so we had to pay for some laptops for clients. Um, I paid a couple of light bills, right? Because we have to make sure that our client services were not interrupted. And then I think we also have to be mindful of this digital generational divide, right? So we had to have uh, some what I call tutorial sessions. And I have to admit, you know, I'm still learning all this technology myself, right? I'm about to tell my age, right? But we had to work with some of our clients who were not up to date on the latest, like what is a Zoom and, you know, all of this technology stuff, right? Um, and so while my staff has been amazing in making sure that no clients uh, sessions were interrupted for nonprofits. It was definitely um, a unexpected financial cost, right? Um, in terms of you know having to pay for things that we normally would not pay for, like I'm paying for multiple Zoom accounts and unexpected technology for clients and some light bills and some Wi-Fi bills and you know all of these things, making sure that. Um, we are keeping the trains moving on time and we are one of few agencies who are operating at the same level that we were pre pandemic because what has happened is a lot of agencies who do sexual violence work are one no longer doing it or two have scaled back drastically right, as a result of the pandemic. And so I'm grateful that we have been able to expand our team, that we've been able to continue to increase our services while still making sure that survivors are getting the support. And this is not just our individual counseling, but we've had groups 
online as well. And again, we have our 24 seven hotline, our rest program, our rapid emotional support team. We are still showing up in the community and providing support. Um, for example, you know, I'm sure folks have heard about Duke Ellington and their sexual assault scandal and they had a big uh, kind of parent town hall and our team led by our deputy director uh, showed up to support the students and the parents. And so, you know, as far as we're concerned that the work of sexual violence still continues in the midst of the pandemic. Wow, that's amazing. So what I got from that is that um, with your organization, there were some structural barriers, of course, that impact BIPOC communities such as the digital divide. So you guys provided the laptops, tutorials and teaching folks how to use Zoom. And I don't wanna tell my age, but <laughs> not only will I have an EDD, but I think I'll have a PhD in Zoom. I'll be a Zoomologist real soon. So, you know, this is great because these are the barriers that keep people from getting the services that they need. Right, and so I do have a question. It's a statistical question, but and I and I'll tell you why. But Tamara, I want to jump over to you. So, just with um, your office, how has COVID nineteen changed what you do? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'll start off by naming the privilege of being housed under an institution of higher education, um, and that privilege protection of not feeling the impacts of financial um, barriers or challenges. And so my hat goes off to you, Indira, as you continue to navigate that. Um, and so I, I'd like to start there. Um, but, but to continue, I think going back to Indira, we provide services through telehealth as well. Like we're doing that over Zoom, over WebEx, whatever form of virtual platform the student, faculty, or staff member uh, wants. If that's over the phone, we do that as well. Um, I think what's interesting about us is that we uh, also can provide in-person support as well um, by request. Uh, we all have access and maintain access to campus, my office. Um, and so we're getting vaccinated. We've all been vaccinated. We've all been going to get COVID tested weekly. So by request, we can provide that support on campus. Now, a lot of our students are not on campus right now, right? They're all throughout the nation internationally. Um, and so we haven't seen much of those, that demand of being um, in person. I actually think we're gonna start to see even when we go back to campus in the fall, which GW is anticipating that, um, that we're gonna see more of our clients wanting to interact with us virtually instead of in person. I think it reduces some of the barriers that they've faced. Um, and so I think that's gonna be an interesting um, outcome of all of this. Um, so that's one, I think two, what we've seen with student population, and so my office, we actually serve students, faculty, staff, and anyone who experiences harm on our campus or adjacent to our campus. So that can be community members in the district in the DC area, that can be an AU student on our campus visiting a DW student, et cetera. Um, but we actually haven't seen an increase in clients. I think that has actually been um, consistent with our numbers, right? I think what we've seen is a change in the need. Um, so though the demand and, and, and we don't have as many, we didn't see an increase in clients, we've seen an increase in demand and need. So for example, you know, our meetings are typically about an hour long with each client. We're seeing the need of having to be in a meeting longer than an hour, like two hours, an hour and a half. Sometimes we got to do a part two within the, the next day, right? And so we're seeing that there is a need of more support and more conversation, but the conversation is not looking like, talk to me about my resources. The conversation is like, this is how I'm feeling and like, I just need to pour it out and let's just talk. The whole hour and a half, two hours, we're really just trying to figure out what's happening in someone's body and head um, and brain and mind and all of that. And so I think that has shifted a lot. Um, and then I think what Indira spoke to we're seeing on our campus is a comp um, com um, compounded trauma. Uh, we're seeing that, you know, more of our students and in the intersections of our identities are definitely showing up as it relates to COVID and the things that were the killings and, and, and all the things we're seeing on TV and media. So, for example, we're seeing the impacts of collective trauma on individual trauma, on trauma in the home, on being a part of an institution that's prim primarily white, right? Like, so we're seeing all of those interconnections. Um, and I think also we're seeing some of the disability exacerbated by trauma as well. 
So as our students are watching all the things take place on social media and their own homes um, as well, they are having some triggers. As we know about trauma and triggers, uh, the triggers are, have the same feeling as the trauma that you've actually experienced. And so uh, as a result of those things, we're seeing that professors are pushing back a little. And so we're seeing the need of academic support. So academic support might look like uh, my office reaching out to a professor on behalf of a student who's experienced harm, asking for support, asking for extensions, asking for flexibility, asking to turn off the camera when they're in class. Um, and we're seeing a lot of pushback from professors um, you know, saying, well, what's wrong with that person? They just need to do their work uh, and then they'll be okay. Or you're saying that they've been triggered or that trauma is watching murders on TV. Like that's not, nothing happened to them, right? So we're actually seeing uh, how institutions of higher education, this gap in services, like there's no, our office is the only place that a city can go to actually talk about some of those things that may not be, um, clear or direct university violations, right? Or things that they want to report. Um, and so how do we kind of, we've been trying to figure out how do we get the backing of professors to understand and validate that just because someone didn't, didn't directly experience harm does not mean that it's not harm or trauma. Um, and so those are some of the things that we're seeing at GW, particularly with my office and my clients. Wow, that was really loaded. Um, yeah, sounds like we need some training for our faculty, right? Um, so thank you for that, Tamara. Thank you so much. So I, just so that people can understand, and this is for you and Dara, just so that we can just lay down the landscape. Tell us what is sexual assault? What is that? And is there a racial disparity? Is there a racial component to that? I'll so, start with you. yeah, absolutely. So, sexual violence can be any unwanted sexual contact, right? It sits on a gender based violence continuum, right? And so, I think that's really, really important to know because historically, what we have known to be true is that sexual violence was in this very narrow paradigm. And the FBI expanded that definition years ago, which is really great. So what we like to say is that it's any unwanted sexual contacts. What we also know to be true is in addition to the stats that we know, which is one in four women have, you know, have experienced sexual violence and one in six men, as well as one in 10 women, over 60% of black women have experienced some sort of sexual violence. And that is really, really critical. That's such a critical number if you really think about it. Black people and other BIPOC folks are disproportionately impacted by sexual violence. Um, and so when we look at the ways in which historically, for example, Black women, historically sexual assault has shown up in our history, going back to slavery, in which you know Black women's bodies um, were used for sexual reproduction and to build white wealth in this country and the medical racism. We just got off the heels of Black Maternal Week, right? Um, and so we, so we really have to think about, um, you know, the ways in which, you know, sexual violence can show up, right? What we also know to be true is that there is medical rape right? People don't think about that. There's medical rape in which you are at a medical exam and not consenting to a procedure and the doctor moves forward anyway, right? We've heard testimony after testimony about how that's happened to Black women. So again, any unwanted sexual contact. Oh, thank you so much. That's, that's quite unfortunate, um, especially looking at our, our medical field where doctors have taken an oath to do no harm. Yet, you know, we see time and time again that people, you know, especially our BIPOC people are being constantly hurt. And there was a story probably like over not too long ago, it was about um, there were women in a detainment center, um, Latinas actually, who were sterilized. They were forcefully sterilized. And you would think, oh my goodness, you know, wh where are we? But this is something that's still happening today. So I, I want to shift. So we talked about sexual violence. 
Um, as you know, there's a story uh, out allegedly about uh, Congressman Matthew Gates, you know, allegedly um, participating in this uh, sex trafficking. What is human trafficking? And is it something that we just see out there in other countries? Is it something that we see out here? Can you talk to me about that, Indira? Yeah, sure. So human trafficking, I think it's important, you know, language is so important, right? We know there's human trafficking, there's sex trafficking, there's commercial sexual exploitation, which primarily deals with the sexual exploitation of children, right? Um, and so we have this kind of global kind of definition of human trafficking, which, you know, really kind of deals with the buying and selling right, of human bodies. And so what we have seen with the congressman is, you know, what's interesting is that folks are struggling with thinking that that is, you know, human trafficking, right? Um, and, you know, what we have to be mindful of is that an, ex an exchange happened, right? An exchange happened for sex. Um, and so we have to be very clear that sometimes, just like sexual violence with human trafficking, sex trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation, it may not look like what we are known for it to look like in its box right? It can show up in very uh, different forms, but we have to look at the elements, right? When we're talking about human trafficking, you know, we're normally talking about the buying and selling. There's some type of exchange of goods or services or, you know, or a payment for sex, right? And so we saw that in the uh, controversy, so to speak, that is surrounding the congressman. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as you stated, language it is very important. It's so important. So this is a question for the both of you. What kinds of laws are put in place to protect um, victims of sexual violence? I know when the Trump administration was in power, there were some rollbacks, especially for Title IX. Um, what, what policies are there on the books to protect us? You, ooh, good question. Uh, sorry, that's a, uh, not a loaded question, but uh, definitely some sentiments that come up with you when you talk about kind of Title IX and, and the rollback of some of that. Um, I, I, I guess I want to start off by saying protection and laws and policies aren't synonymous, right? Like a survivor can receive protection and healing not just through that method or not just through uh, the Title IX process or a conduct process, right? And so I think it's important that the way I answer your question is that, yeah, there are some laws in place uh, to, for someone to seek justice, but are those laws survivor-centered? Are those laws take into account um, how trauma looks in a, <laughs> um, report finding investigation. So I want to be clear that the Title IX process now mirrors the criminal justice process. There's cross-examination that occurs. In order for you to move forward with the formal complaint, you have to go through some of those things that you would deal with um, in a criminal justice system. And so I just start off with that. I think to continue, when we think about protection, I think it's important that we center, and as Vendera will probably talk about as well, like we center what the person wants and needs. It goes back to what Andira said at the beginning, healing looks different for every single person. And so everything about protection is really important for me to say that one way of healing is not uh, always going to be the way of healing for, for another person. Um, and so when we think about institutions of higher education, I think it's really important that institutions have um, advocates, uh, survivor advocates, those who are trained in trauma, those who um, recognize and know the rights and options on and off campus that include, but not just about reporting options, right? And able to weigh uh, those pros and cons and speak to uh, the patterns that we see within those systems when using those systems, right? Um, often we hear students say, particularly at GW, we hear students say who come to our office that, you know, 
I'm not interested in getting that person in trouble. Like oftentimes that, that's not the goal. The goal is like, how do I like move forward with this? Like, I don't want this to be in my head all day, every day, right? Like, I don't want to have to keep thinking about this. So oftentimes protection is emotional protection. Um, it's physical protection. Is this person in my class? Can I just get out of that class or can they get removed from class, right? So it's not often like I want to move forward and seek justice through filing a formal report or going through and talking with a police officer. It's often how do I find solace and peace in myself to move forward? But also sometimes we hear that students are like, you know, connecting their healing with protecting the community, right? And talking through that it is not your right. Um, to, and when we think about black and brown folks, that collectiveness kind of culture that we have of, uh, you know, I equals we, right? And so I think it's important that we talk through some of that, right? Like we can't erase that. We can't minimize that feeling, but how do we make sure that we don't sacrifice yourself and your healing for the needs of a community, right? Um, and it's not on you. I think it's important that we say to students, it's not on you to fix and hold the respondent or suspect accountable. Um, because even if you don't move forward with X, that person can still harm other folks. Even if you do move forward with X, that person can still harm folks. Um, and so really talking about that. So I think to answer your question and to wrap it up is institutions really uh, putting their finances and resources into offices like mine um, that can get folks connected to offices and organizations like Indira that can actually provide a space for folks to think through what they need what is their body doing? What is their mind? Like they, they can't even think straight. Like how do you begin to allow space for folks to process and engage in healing um, without telling them that you must do one thing? Like you have to go and report to the, uh, your university to, to receive that healing. So the, I'll stop there and I'll let anyone else kind of weigh in on that. I appreciate that. Indira, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one thing we have to keep in mind is that each jurisdiction has different laws for sexual assault survivors, right, which can make it really challenging. But I think when I think about on a national level, you know, we have kind of two prominent uh, laws, so to speak, slash bills, one, the Violence Against Women Act that got reauthorized, uh, which is really um, exciting. It provides a plethora of protections for survivors of sexual violence. There's also the Survivors Bill of Rights um, as well, which is also an exciting piece of legislation that again, um, continues to expand off of what the Violence Against Women Act does. And then I think even when I think about here in DC on a local level, right? Um, in 2019, DC Council just passed a Sexual Assault Victims' Rights Amendment Act which expanded the right to an advocate for survivors of sexual violence, right? So I think when we're looking at policies and laws, I think there's kind of the criminal piece, right? But then there's also the other piece that really deals with how survivors are engaging in the system. Um, what are the laws and their rights as it relates to their perk kit, as it relates to having an advocate, as it relates <clears throat> to uh, them giving interviews and showing up to uh, testify and all of those things, right? I think that there's still a lot of work to be done as it relates to creating more policies and laws, specifically around what does it mean when you are sexually assaulted and you get pregnant as a result of that rape and you decide to keep your child, but then what does it mean to parent with your rapist, right? Um, you know, there's been a lot of, so that's kind of one example. Another example, a lot of states have uh, kind of eliminated statute of limitations as it relates to particularly childhood um, sexual abuse um, and survivors being able to come, to come forward and press charges, even if it happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, we think that's fantastic, right? Because we know the healing journey Right, um, and so again, there's so much work that still needs to be done around it, but we've definitely made some, made some headway and I think there's still um, some places where we can move the needle on a local as well as national level. Thank you, thank you so much. And you both touched on something um, that's 
quite interesting. You talked about healing. Um, you talked about all of that. So with COVID-19 and just so many issues surrounding mental health, what have you seen just in your work with the needs of our survivors with mental health and what can we do to, you know, satisfy those needs? What can we do to help? I mean, yeah, I think what we have seen, um, again, it's been uh, unprecedented the way in which survivors have shown up over the last year, year and a half. Um, their sexual trauma, as well as kind of the mental health impact as a result of that has been compounded. Um, it would be lost on me if I did not say that our BIPOC survivors are experiencing it at an extraordinary level as a result of the racial trauma and the racial reckoning that is happening, right? Um, and so- And Dara, talk more about that. Talk more about that. Yeah, I think, you know, again, as I mentioned, that we can't talk about sexual violence without talking about state sanctioned violence and that intersection. And so, for example, we saw what happened during the um, Capitol Hill attacks, February 6th, right? And we saw the attack on our democracy. We saw what that did to everybody. And so that was a trauma that happened. And so if you were a sexual assault survivor still working and dealing with your sexual trauma, then you bear witness to another trauma. What we have is a compounded trauma. And so what we also saw during that time is members of Congress, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, Congresswoman Cortez, Congresswoman Gwen Moore, other BIPOC Congresswomen came out and said how triggered they were. Um, during that time, they openly identified as survivors of sexual violence and talked about just the impact of being a survivor and bearing witness to all the other traumas going on, right? Because when, you know, BIPOC folks have a very challenging relationship, right? Needless to say, uh, with violence and trauma coupled with the sexual trauma that is being held in your nervous system, right? Trauma holds in the body, right? And if you have not processed that um, on a way, if that has not quote unquote been reconciled within your nervous system, right? Even if it has, something can trigger it, right? AKA the, you know, uh, attacks that happened on February 6th. And you can be experiencing uh, all of those symptoms of all of those symptoms again, just like it happened yesterday. Right, And so part of the reason why our work at the Rape Crisis Center has been extraordinarily heavy is because we aren't just dealing with the sexual trauma. We're dealing with the racial reckoning. We're dealing with the trauma of the George Floyd trial and all of the other forms of racism um, that has shown up in our society in particular over the last year that has been under the umbrella of the COVID trauma. Right, um, and even talking about the impact of racism as it relates to COVID, right? Um, so again, we have to be really, really mindful and intentional that if you are not doing sexual violence work from the intersections, you're missing the boat, right? Um, what's also important, and you know, folks may have some issues with it, but it's the truth, is that it means something to BIPOC survivors to see BIPOC folks, professionals who are doing this work, right? Um, I'm so proud that we have historically and currently are a black woman led agency. Um, my deputy director is also a black woman, the founding mothers of the DC Rape Crisis Center. One of them, Loretta Ross um, is also, a, is you know, black women, right? And it means something, right? It means something. And so I think we have to be intentional about not just our service delivery, but who's delivering the services, right? Almost, and yeah, I, almost like having um, yeah. an African-American physician or, or right. you know, right. a black provider, right. yeah. Right, and, you know, just so I'm clear, it's not about, 
you know, staffing your office with all these black and brown people, right? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there has to be intentionality around becoming an anti-racist organization and what that means. As I have said, you cannot workshop your way out of racism, right? You can't post on social media your 10 to 12 points for being an anti-racist organization and then treat your black colleagues less than human. Because then my question is, how are you treating the black and BIPOC survivors? Yeah, and Dara, you need to repeat that again for the people in the back. Say it again. Right? So we have to have a real conversation, a real racial reckoning, particularly in Washington, D.C. and some of the other surrounding areas, right? Um, we have to be really, really clear around what are the needs of survivors of sexual violence. What we know to be true at the DC Work Rape Crisis Center is that our work is not just within our four walls, right? We are in the community. We are hanging out east of the river in wards five, seven, and eight. We're hanging out at the bus stops. We're going to the church meetings, right? We're going to the church services. If they ask us and they will let us in, we will come, right? Um, and so that is the type of outreach and communication that we're needing in order to bridge this gap around language, right? Because we have to have an intergenerational conversation around sexual violence. I will never forget when Reverend Lamar um, from Metropolitan AME Church in DC invited us um, as an agency to come to church and to really talk about um, sexual violence um, in the black community. We were also getting a award from them as well. And so we showed up on a Sunday. It was also Pentecostal Sunday. So if you know anything about the black church, we were there all day, right? But it was powerful to hear a black preacher, a man say that we aren't afraid to talk about sexual violence here in this church. And there are other preachers who have done that as well. Alpha Street Baptist Church, I'm a member of that church. Um, Reverend Howard John Wesley um, has done a beautiful job of uplifting um, sexual violence, particularly in the Black community. So I think these are the conversations that we need to have. Wow, that's powerful. That's powerful, especially um, in the Black church. That is uh, very powerful. And I know we've had services like that at Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church, where I belong. Um, Kendrick Curry is the pastor. So Tamara, I, I, so as colleges are coming back in session in the fall, we have first time freshmen, all of that. What, what, how is that going to change? What can we do? What preventive measures can we do to educate not just our students, but staff and faculty about sexual violence? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it, it goes into our students have to see themselves within the education, like within the material. Um, you know, as you asked at the beginning of the conversation, how do we define sexual assault? Uh, I, I think for my office, we've been moving away from leading with those terms, sexual violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, because often people of color don't see them, their experiences within that. So how do we begin to like identify the behavior that they're experiencing? Because those behaviors have been normalized, right? Like those, those, so I think it's important one to be frank and more practical about what students and people are experiencing um, within the educational material so that they can see themselves, that's one. I think too, it takes buy-in from leadership for sure. Um, you know, my office, we always say we, we have a cognitive dissonance between like requiring educational workshops versus having folks just show up because they want to. Um, but I think, you know, and we still don't really know which way we, we, we land, but I think it's really having buy-in from, from leadership and actually um, having this be a priority. Like, and when I, I don't mean like checking a box, like, oh, we do care about survivors. Here you go. This is why we have this office. Like, 
continue, I think it's important that we have collaborative partners within the university, right? And when I, that's what I mean by having leadership buy-in, them being a part of the conversations, right? Um, because we can do all these things on the ground and have amazing programs and have these amazing conversations with various populations within our community. But until our leadership actually moves the needle and, 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 and changes the culture, um, I think it's gonna be hard for us to begin to see the impacts of it. That's two. Um, I think three, what we've been doing um, is really meeting our students. So where they are and, and so when they come back to campus, uh, some of the things that we did prior to COVID um, is going into those spaces. So similar to what Indira talked about within the community, going into the community and going to where the different clients and, and just people are, individuals are, we do that as well on campus. So we're going to where our students are hanging out. We're going to the Quad, we're going to Kogan Plaza, we're going to MSSC. For folks who don't know that, that's our multicultural student services center. We're sitting in the different dining halls, right? And those are where you're actually having those impactful and real conversations. Um, and I also think giving folks the tools um, throughout different mechanisms. So now we see the virtual kind of uh, life that we live. So us thinking through how do we provide um, education virtually? Uh, when I mean virtually, I mean like on our website, what kind of tools and, and things can we be uh, providing students who may not want to disclose to us, right? Like why is it that in order for someone to get help, they have to disclose? Some folks healing, they don't want to disclose to us. They don't want to talk to a stranger. They don't want to talk to an advocate. Um, and so how can we still set up some of those spaces, whether it be on campus or virtually, for students to still engage in some healing aspect? And so some things we've been thinking about for the fall is creating spaces on campus for healing. And so opening different um, rooms where folks can go and have some different kind of drawing, art, dancing, some song, what, music, whatever, within those spaces that folks can go to engage in some of that coping and navigating and processing without having to talk to an advocate. You can if you would like, right? That's an option. Um, and then lastly, what we're doing as well is a survivor fund. Uh, we have just set that up uh, um, and our office is collecting uh, financial uh, donations from anyone and everyone to go directly to the pockets of our um, clients who need assistance. So what we've been seeing um, as a result of COVID on trauma with our clients is home insecurity. Um, a lot of our students, as you know, have had to go back home and quote unquote home is not home. Um, home is where they're not seen. Home is where I did, their identities are like, who are you? You want to be what? You want to be called? No. that's And, and so I think our students feel more alone. Um, and so some of the this fun can help some of those things. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing and hoping to do. Uh, and I'll leave room for, for anyone else to add. Wow, that's great. So proud of the work that you're doing, Tamara. And you brought up something else. Um, and that's with rape culture. Uh, we've seen that there are things that are just normalized. And so I don't know if you guys heard about uh, Space Jam 2 and they they cut out Pepe Le Pew, the, the skunk, because they, yeah, people were saying, you know, this adds to rape culture. But um, what are your thoughts on moving the needle with the normalization of rape culture in our society? I'll start with you, Andira. Yeah, I think, you know, rape culture, like we have to begin to pluck at the root, which is rape culture in order to continue to move the needle, right? And so what we know is that rape culture shows up again in various forms, right? It's not just in the locker rooms or on the field, you know, it's in the boardrooms, it's, you know, in the offices, it's in the doctor, like anywhere, where there is an imbalance of power, rape culture can show up, right? Um, and so I think people say, oh, you know, I want to end sexual violence X, Y, and Z. That's great, but you have to get to the root, right? How are we dealing with the culture that really continues to perpetuate it? And so, you know, of course, you know, anyone who does sexual violence work, um, you know, really believes in prevention and education 
um, you know, in all of those things. I think what we saw um, at the height of the Me Too movement that started in 2017, but really, you know, was activated long before that, 2009, 2010 by Tarana Burke, is just, again, raising this level of, of awareness where now we're normalizing, starting to normalize the conversation around sexual violence, right? Me Too has become so normal in terms of the way in which people are trying to hold other folks accountable, right? We saw the biggest, um, what I call one of the biggest kind of Me Too's, right, in sports, right, around the gymnastics situation. But what we have to remember is, again, this goes into rape culture and how it can be divided down racial lines. When R. Kelly, when the R. Kelly series came out on Lifetime, the Black girls and the Black women, they didn't get any love. They did not get any love. Folks were questioning where were their parents, right? Victim blaming, right? But the U.S. gymnastic girls, predominantly white, got all the love, all the love, right? And, and so there wasn't any questions or doubts or saying where were their parents and things like that for the most part, right? And so we have to continue to look at how Black women survivors and white women survivors are treated when they come out with their Me Too right? It is telling. It is telling. But what I will also say, again, going to rape culture, is there has to be an internal reckoning within BIPOC communities. For example, Bill Cosby, right? This is where the intergenerational conversation comes in, right? We can't, we can't break away and chip away at rape culture without having these hard accountability conversations. So BIPOC folks, we need to level up, roll up, because when everything went down with Bill Cosby, it was divided down generations, right? Folks were like, he's the pudding pop guy. He's Bill Cosby, right? Cliff Huxtable. And I said, y'all gotta separate Cliff Huxtable from Bill Cosby. He's not the pudding pop guy. He didn't rape not one, not two, not three, not four, not five. I'm talking 60, 60 women, right? So however you feel about Cliff Huxtable, we need to talk about the reality of Bill Cosby and why we as BIPOC folks struggle with having accountability with some of our high profile black folks who um, have been convicted or accused, right? We see with T.I. and Tiny, right? We saw it with Michael Jackson, right? All of these, right? It goes into rape culture, right? Because we don't think what happened was quote unquote sexual violence. Wow. That's, that's heavy. That's loaded. Tamara, do you want to comment? And then we have a raised hand. Go yeah, ahead, Tamara. Sure. Just to add, I think what I'm hearing Indira speak to is like the normalization of dehumanizing and like authentication of black women and brown women, right? Like, it's so ingrained in our community that we don't even see it as problematic. And so when we're calling it out, it's like, what you talking about? It's always more of, it goes back to slavery. I, you know, it's, it's, again, going, all of it is interconnected to that. How black women and black bodies aren't seen as humans, right? And so when we, when we call out harm against their bodies, it's like, no, they did something to, to, to do that. Or how can you, um, going back to some of this collective culture, how can you um, perpetuate this, this culture against Black men? How are you trying to say that they're a threat? And now you're trying to say that they deserve to be in jail. When you call out, when you're trying to call out harm done to a Black woman, those are some of the things that people are starting to, you, you move away from the experience that someone just had, the harm that someone's experienced. So how do we protect Black men? How do we protect, et cetera? I think that goes back to show the patriarchy that exists so it's not just patriarchy, but it's also racism and all these other things that are compounded for black and brown women when we're talking about rape culture. So beginning to name, um, call out in yourself, but also call out in your own families and friendships, um, beliefs and kind of uh, values that perpetuate rape culture. Right, it goes back to even looking at 
back in the day, I was a children's social worker. So, um, oh, well, she was just fast. She, she was just a fast tail little girl. And it's no, she's not. She's a child. So I just wanted to add my two cents. But I think I'm going to allow someone to talk. Um, Dorothy Chandler, go ahead. You have your hand raised. And you can unmute yourself. You're still muted, Dorothy. Yeah, you're still muted. <laughs> Um, let me try to help you out, Dorothy. And while you're doing that, I mean, we can speak to that example you just provided about yes. um, if someone says, oh, you're fast, right? Um, the way that you can check that is where did that language, okay, tell me more about how they're fast. Tell me more about that, right? Um, and then beginning to get at the root because I've heard, you've heard your own family members say some of those things. What, was, what were they wearing? That girl was always hanging out with blah, 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 right? Okay, let's talk about that. And you have to begin to name for them that you know that's privilege that you're talking, right? You're basically trying to police a, a black woman's body, right? You're saying because she did this, she deserved this. Let's move the, the focus from what a survivor might have done because that's not survivor, survivor didn't do anything let's move it to the person who actually caused the harm right so i think beginning to call out and name some of the comments for what they are with our close friends and family members because that relationship allows us to hold them accountable you know it's hard for a stranger like me to call you know and dare out and be like you just said that that's not right for these reasons but if you have a relationship with that person that person i think it reduces some of that defense mechanism it may be there but it reduces it so you can have an actual conversation around why is it problematic and this is how you can address it so it goes back to the point of we got to do this work in ourselves and also within our intimate communities um, in order to change the narrative. Yeah, it looks like um, Dorothy, you can't mute, unmute. So that's OK. Um, so, ladies, it's 702. I'm going to be naughty, even though we're supposed to stop now. Just give me some last words. Last words. What is it that you want our audience to know? I'm going to start with you, Andira. Yeah, I think what I'll say is that healing is possible, right? Um, it's never too late to, get, to seek help. Um, what I will say is no matter where you are on your journey, uh, know that you aren't alone, that this is a marathon, right? Um, and not a sprint. Um, this is what I call soul work. Um, one of the best decisions I made in addition to being a social worker um, is saying yes to the DC Rape Crisis Center. Um, I am so excited that I get to wake up and be a part of survivor's journey. For me, there is no higher honor. And so I want you to know that we are here, that we're standing with you, that you are the GPS in which we take our direction from. And so as we continue to, you know, move forth, I encourage you all to take care of your heart. Um, because as I like to say, this is not hard work, but this is heart work. So thank you all so much. Hey, Amen. That's beautiful. It's heart work. I like that. Tamara? How do you follow that? Uh, how do you follow? I think it's really interesting that as advocates, we have some of those similar analogies uh, because I talk about how I'm the windshield wiper or the tire for a, a survivor in their healing. So the survivor is driving the car and the car is their healing journey and I'm wherever they want me to be in that car. Um, so I think it's interesting that you use some, something similar to the GPS. Um, I think just quickly and, and really direct is um, you're not alone, right? I think that you know you have people who care about you who believe you um and i i think lastly is that we need other folks to begin to continue to have we need other folks to continue these conversations in order for us to um in this, it is intersected with racism and all these other things. So before we can end sexual assault, we got to work on all these other things. It's like we got to do all of these things simultaneously. 
Um, and I just want folks to know that we are trying to do this work. We're going to continue to do the work, no matter how big of the impact. Um, and that for, for the Rodham Institute, I think it's important that you all use the platform, continue to use the platform. So thank you, Ashanti, for tagging in some of your Black colleagues and women to be on this call to have this conversation that is new to this platform, but continuing to talk more about this in spaces that folks think are disconnected to the work, right? It doesn't matter if you're a biology major, if you are whatever, like it connects to this work. Um, and so I, I think I would just end there and say that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a public health issue and it's about health equity. So that's what Rodham is all about and that's what we're gonna continue to do. So on behalf of Dr. Jahan El Bayumi, Dr. Gigi, we just wanna thank you Indira, thank you Tamara for your, your heart work and we stand with you. So thank you all so much. Thank you to those in Facebook land and thank you to those who join us on Zoom. Until next time, see ya. And I hope you will join us on Thursday, May 6th for our seventh annual Rodham Summit, where we will be discussing breaking the silence and the stigma of mental illness. And we will be joined by former Secretary of State and former First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. So thank you, take care, bye. Thank you.